Okay. Right. Uh, thank you all for joining, and especially after a break. Uh, and today, uh, Linda is doing double duty. She is working as well as she is uh, hosting the Bible study. Uh, welcome to you, all of you. And Franklin, who has just joined us, thank you for joining. Uh -huh. And of course, I can see Mrs. Noah is uh, on the on the screen. Uh, I, I like I mentioned, uh, yeah, Praveen is uh, busy today, so we will continue with our uh, spiritual discipline, uh, uh, you know, topic. And uh, to begin with, let me let me go ahead and pray and ask for God's presence with us. Join me as I pray, loving, gracious Father. Thank you again for a Wednesday evening when we all come together to learn and to grow, to be educated in your scriptures, uh, to know who you are and the character you have. And Lord, such a pleasure to be able to uh, learn and study the Bible and as well as have a discussion. Thank you for my brothers and sisters from various parts of our country. Uh, and also from here in Hyderabad, we pray, Lord, that you will just uh, bless our time together. Uh, help us to, uh, as we discuss, uh, uh, help us to, you know, to help each other to learn and to grow in your grace and mercy. And so in all of this, we are grateful to you for your continued presence and your blessings upon us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, well, now it's lovely to see Mrs. Noah, and yes, thank you so much for joining us, Doris. Uh, Sikinder has just joined us, uh, and uh, uh, welcome back to our Wednesday evening study. Well, what we're going to do today is uh, we have a few more topics under the broad heading of spiritual discipline. Uh, we want to uh, today, discuss the spiritual discipline of service. Normally, I don't think we would have considered this as a spiritual discipline, but I think the scriptures uh, indicate how important it is for us to be involved in this activity called service. Now, I think we can very safely say that serving and providing service to one another, to others, is something that is recognized by all faiths, right? Uh, no matter which faith you come from, and everybody gives importance to, uh, you know, uh, to service, providing service to one another. People from all walks of life, even those who have no faith in a, in a, uh, you know, a, a sovereign God who may even be atheists, recognize the need for serving one another, right? Uh, and especially many faiths believe it is, uh, it, it, uh, I mean to say, it is essential to serve one another. And it is encouraged, uh, you know, very much as an important aspect of their walk of life. Now, obviously, we as Christian, in the Christian faith, uh, you know, also give, tremendous importance to service, and we know how Christians serve in various, uh, you know, ways. Uh, we hear the big names, names like Mother Teresa uh, or, or a person like David Livingston. Uh, these are people who are stalwarts, you know, in the discipline of service. They serve so selflessly and so wonderfully. Um, I think we can also say that in, in our country, we Christians are recognized for uh, providing quality services, especially in the educational field, as well as in the medical field. Uh, Christians uh, are, uh, you know, are noted for building hospitals and going into villages and serving. And I still remember visiting my, my sister uh, and my brother-in-law, who were also, you know, in the medical field uh, and the medical mission, they used to serve in a rural village, in a remote village in Maharashtra. 
and uh, they used to serve very, very poor people. So, uh, and of course, schools and colleges established by Christian institutions are well noted. Unfortunately, uh, the Christian service, the services that we provide has also been criticized because there are some who think that Christians serve only to convert. And that is a discussion I'd like, you know, maybe for us to throw some light. Uh, is, there, is there truth in that? And if it is true, what is it that we need to do, you know, need to change so that we are not considered to use our services, uh, you know, or rather I should say we use the services for the good of the people and for the good of the country. And so we will discuss that. So maybe one important discussion we need to get into today is why should we serve, right? Why should uh, uh, we as Christians involve ourselves in service? So that's one thing that I would touch upon today and look at some scriptures. Before we get into the meat of the discussion, uh, uh, let us, uh, let me have your thoughts, you know, maybe I should ask the question and maybe you can uh, you know, answer the question, what motivates you to serve? And many of you serve in various ways and capacities. What is the motivation behind your uh, desire to serve and your commitment to serve. And perhaps you may also want to mention if you have served in some special way, uh, how have you served? So let me hear some thoughts from you and then we will uh, continue with uh, what I have prepared for you. Okay. So who want to go first? Yes, Surimurti, go ahead. Please unmute yourself. Yes, uh -huh. Thank you. I have not done any missionary work yeah. for service. But whenever somebody is in need and yeah. if you can help him, automatically you have the feeling that you have to, under any circumstances, if you can, yeah. serve him. Okay. Yes, uh, Surimurti, thank you for that. And I, 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 I still remember how you helped, you know, those uh, tribal families uh, to come and uh, locate themselves on your piece of land that you had in Kandwa and how you provided that service for them. I still remember that. But is there any other motivation? I know you want to help, but what is, is there anything else that motivates you to want to serve? Nothing else other than inbound feeling. <laughs> okay. Right. Yes, thank you. Yes. Anybody else have any particular motivation that makes them want to serve, live a life of service? <laughs> yes, Franklin, go ahead. Yes, you are unmuted, Franklin. So one, one minute. Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we okay. can hear you. Sir, um, why serve? Why do we? Why do we serve? Okay. So the simple reason is. Uh, is we serve because now it's an expression of God's love for us. Okay. We allow God's love to flow to others. Yes. Uh, when we care and when we uh, help others, we are uh, reflecting God's love in our lives. Right. And uh, sir, I, I must say, sir, that uh, uh, Christianity provided uh, this concept of service to the world. So many of the secular uh, clubs and societies borrow the uh, phrases, no, sir? service with a smile, service above self, service to man, service to God. All these uh, concepts, no, sir? all these concepts and ideas find their origin in the Bible. The, the Bible is the basis okay. because of the biblical, Judeo-Christian biblical ethic, uh, just like science, the service, the concept of service flourish, flourishes. Yes, uh, Franklin, thank you for that, those thoughts. Uh, undoubtedly, uh, the, uh, the whole concept of service has been very, very, very much strengthened by the Christian ethos and from the scriptures. But of course, uh, some may beg to differ. Some may say service is basic, hu you know, humanism or, hu you know, uh, uh, your common humanity makes you want to serve. So some may, may, 
may say it is not necessarily scriptural, but it, it comes, it flows from within you uh, as a human being. Right? Uh, but anyway, that is debatable. Yeah. Uh, Pastor, I want to come in here. Yes, Pauline, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Pastor, uh, first of all, uh, my late mother's name is Suguna. Suguna. So I was brought up on that. The which is Su is good. Guna is a nature. So that was there f- uh, for me. And uh, in my colony in Maripalli, I I'm not a missionary, but in my own way, it's like inborn. I try to help people. Um, I think in a way, whoever helps, uh, you know, to an extent, a bit selfish also, because selfish in the sense, you know, you get the feel-good factor. Before you go to bed, you said, God, I've done something. I feel good. So it's, uh, you know, two-way like. And then um, service to God is service to mankind. Uh, because we are made in his in image and uh, Christianity is all about, uh, you know, as the others just said, love, caring. So, um, yes, that's what I wanted to tell you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Of course, uh, it seemed that your motivation uh, is seen to be uh, spurred by the fact, the feel good factor. And it is, it is natural, isn't it? When you help and yes. serve, there is a very... A natural feeling of, uh, you know, uh, uh, feeling accomplished, a uh, feeling that you've done well. Right? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, Bertram, go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself. Yes, uh, I would go along with uh, what uh, Mr. Poppin said, and uh, uh, the origin. Uh, God is a great. He serves. He, I mean, he made everything for our service for, you know, to fulfill his purpose. He is a great example to us. And uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a missionary myself. And I, uh, I, I can't compare with, with, the, with what God would really have me to do. But I feel that uh, this thing uh, is in, it comes to mind that we are blessed as a mission statement. Our mission statement says, be blessed and be a blessing to others. That... Uh, uh, you know, uh, that sort of motivates me. Of course, it comes from God. It motivate, motivates me to serve, you know, in uh, one way or the other. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Bertie. Several of you said that you were not a missionary, but, you know, <laughs> you don't have to be a missionary to serve. Uh, you serve in very simple ways. I think uh, uh, Surya Murthy just said, anybody in need, when you, when you take care of that need, it is a form of service. But yes, uh, those uh, uh, biblical thoughts are very, very important. Vanessa, you had a thought. Yeah. Okay. Uh, What I wanted to uh, say is that uh, I have been motivated from the time I was in school. I was in a hostel, in a boarding school, where uh, in a convent school. So we, along with the nuns, we used to have uh, a certain day where we used to go and help the poor so the children like bring them to the school and teach them and play with them so i've always had it in me of going for children that is why education is now my profession anyway there was a time in my life way back when i wasn't uh, like i am now able to afford and having an income and something so i was very down at one time in my life uh, and they were always i mean god has been great and has always sent someone to me to help without me asking i have always seen that someone has come and helped me uh, whether it is physically mentally financially but there has been someone so i always feel that if i have been given i am always being given something in time of need so i always see and look for people whom i can give without them asking me yeah so i see many of my friends also financially they are not very stable they're not very good so i i feel like every month like if i send them maybe a small amount but it is a surprise to them and they feel so happy then even uh others i in my profession teaching like uh now i'm of course principal but when when i was even a teacher or a principal i always like poor people or 
or those who can't afford, I used to give concession to them and like in certain small ways, whichever way I can, I feel that how much I am getting is that much I give, even if in a small way. So that I think serves God. Even if you bring a smile to someone's face, I think then God is happy that, okay, you have done something and made a person happy even for a few minutes. So I think serving in any way, whether it is big or small, whether we are giving or we are taking or anything, I think it's it's service to God. Okay. Well, thank you, Vanessa. Yes. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly uh, you know, uh, you mentioned how you have been helped and you recognize, uh, you know, that and that motivates you to want to help others. You, you've seen how you benefited and so you want to benefit others. And that is, uh, I think that's valid. And uh, we thank you for that. And uh, uh, yes, any other thoughts? I'm not um, sure. Uncle Zach? Yes, Shanti, go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, I wanted to all uh, say, add something to the discussion. Um, there are generally two sets of principles in life, right? The worlds and Christ. Uh, usually man's philosophies, man's outward view, everything is, uh, you know, is more man-centered focus, right? Um, they are, their life focus is totally here on this earth and all that man can make, man can do, that is it. But with Christ, uh, for us being in Christ, it is not so. So I wanted us to look at uh, Colossians 3, uh, I'm not doing the whole verses, but 1 to 17. Uh, it talks about put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. It talks about what things are needed for service, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven. So you also must forgive and put above all these on love, which binds everything, uh, binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in all this. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I think for us as Christians, for us, we are dead to the world. Once we are in Christ, we are alive in Christ, right? Whereas man's philosophies, everything is based for man, by man. So all that they look at is also more in terms of, sorry about the noises behind, um, more in terms of for man. Uh, I think that's where they kind of uh, misunderstand our Christian service. Because they think we are doing it for man. But we are doing it or we are helping other people with the attitude and with the way that we are doing it. It's because we are in Christ. Uh, if we are not in Christ and not doing it for Christ, then there's definitely we are in the, in the world's uh, point of view then. Yes. Yes, Shanti, thank you. I think that's well said. And I think many of you seem, you know, I think... Uh, basically recognize uh, the motivation that Christians must have to serve. And I think uh, several of you said that it is reflecting God's love and it is because of Christ. And I think that is unique to the Christian faith. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, if there are no more comments, uh, I'd, let me just go ahead and share what I have and then we will come back for some more discussion, if that is okay. All right. Yes. I hope, uh, Sitina, you can hear us. I, I uh, noticed that you tried to call me, but <laughs> un unable to take your call at this time. So uh, as we get into this uh, discussion on uh, why we serve and the whole spiritual discipline of service, let me just remind us, just in case we've forgotten, uh, about what spiritual disciplines are, just as a uh, a refresher for us to know uh, and that we are on the same page. We are discussing spiritual disciplines and spiritual disciplines are behaviors that facilitate spiritual growth or spiritual maturity, right? Uh, because we as Christians are engaged in transformation. We are in the process or on a journey of becoming. We are transforming being transformed, the renewing of our mind. And what we understand is these spiritual disciplines help us to uh, 
attain that sense of growth and maturity. Uh, just to look at the contrary to it, uh, spiritual disciplines are not works that save us. We don't do these things to be saved. We are saved by Christ, in Christ, through Christ, right? Uh, there is no saving through any of our works. Spiritual disciplines are not laws that we must obey. Uh, they are basically disciplines that we engage in so that we are being transformed on a regular basis. Uh, once again, reminding us of uh, one of the uh, in interesting verses, or rather I should say quotations from Dallas Will Willard, who is one of those who has written extensively on this. He says, spiritual disciplines, I mean, if we, if we don't engage in spiritual disciplines, it's not a sin to ignore them, but it's not wise to ignore them because they are of such tremendous benefit. Okay, having said that, let me just uh, bring some thoughts from the scriptures uh, in terms of the spiritual discipline of service, why we serve and all of those things. First and foremost, there is no doubts about the fact that the Bible, our scriptures, affirm the need to serve. There is definitely, uh, you know, a very strong emphasis on Christians being engaged in service. <laughs> so if I can go back to what I said earlier, we don't have to be necessarily a missionary to serve. If you are a follower of, follower of Christ, well, you are in the business of service. Let me just bring two scriptures to your attention. One is, Galatians chapter 5 and uh, 13, it says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, and here is what uh, Paul uh, emphasized, serve one another humbly in love. So here is a very, very clear call for us as Christians to serve. And who are to be to serve? Serve one another. So our calling is to definitely serve uh, those of us who are in the faith. But the scriptures doesn't stop with our serving just one another. Notice Galatians chapter 6 verse 10, what it says. Galatians 6 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone. And then he also qualifies it by saying, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So very clearly, uh, we are to serve everyone, not just those of the faith. We should, perhaps I should say, we should serve all of humanity, especially as, the Paul, as Paul emphasizes, those who belong to uh, the faith. So, uh, so I just stopped with these two scriptures. There are several other scriptures uh, but I won't take the time to read all of that. They're all telling us, showing us the importance of living a life of service. And some, of course, like you mentioned, missionaries have dedicated their lives to service. I was mentioning to you about David Livingston. He was a medical doctor. He went to Africa. And, you know, he served till his dying day, just helping people, you know, through uh, his medical practice. Really helping those, you know, uh, infested with malaria and things of that nature. Now let's go to that very important question that I posed. And uh, so we will probably, uh, you know, spend a little bit more time on this. Why should a Christian serve? And some of you articulated very well. Let me just reinforce that thought through some of the scriptures that I have chosen. Uh, I've chosen two passages for us to know. Why does a Christian serve? Um, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus brings something very interesting uh, with regards to service and rather he should he, he, he challenges the, the worldly norm. I think as Shanti said, you know, the worldly way of looking at things. Jesus uh, sometimes went completely against the cultural norms of the world. Let me read you uh, a portion from Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 42, it says, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them, 
and the high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for any for many so you notice in that scripture jesus challenges the regular you know uh, thought that goes around that rulers are supposed to exercise authority and lord it over others right uh, and he changes the whole thing he he turns it on its head and he says rulers and those in authority are to become servants right they are to serve. Uh, so, and then he cites his own example where he says, the son of man, he himself, and who can be greater than him in terms of uh, one in authority, uh, one who has, who is a ruler, who is a king. He himself uh, came to serve uh, in, of course, he, he mentions, talks about his death and he gave his life for the others. Now, sometimes when we talk about Jesus giving his life for the world and life for us, some people don't probably fully uh, comprehend what it entails or what it really means. So Jesus doesn't stop there in helping us understand the importance of service. He shows it by a very practical example, right? Uh, which they could understand, especially in their cultural situation. And I'm sure you know where uh, this is mentioned. John chapter 13. Jesus uh, once again brings out this very powerful practical uh, example of once again, uh, you know, of service. Let me read to you that portion in scripture uh, in John 13, beginning in verse 12. Here the, the author says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? And you will recall that he had just washed the disciples' feet. Right? Uh, verse 13, he goes on to say, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I, uh, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So here Jesus, uh, you know, utilizes his authority as the master and law and teacher of them. And then he shows them that uh, his real service, I mean, his real, what do you say, uh, uh, you know, gift to them is the way he has served them. And of course, uh, as you will know, in that culture, only servant, a servant does what he did, actually wash the feet of the disciples. And of course, you know the story uh, of that uh, that example. I mean, uh, there are many things we can say about that, but I'll uh, sufficient to say that Jesus Christ demonstrated what service indeed was, uh, where he, like Surya Murthy said, took care, of, took care of a need. And by taking care of the need of the, you know, washing the dirty feet of the disciples, he showed them what a Lord a ruler, a king, a master would, would do uh, in terms of his, uh, you know, relationship with his disciples. It, it is to serve. So once again, I'm going to stop there because, you know, there are many, several more scriptures uh, we can use. But let me come to that question that we have posed. Why do Christians serve? Right. And from these two examples, very clearly we can establish the fact because we serve because we are called to be servants of the world, <laughs> right? So a Christian basically is a servant. Uh, as a follower of Christ, we are nothing more but servants of this world, 
we are not just servants of the lord yes we are servants of the lord but the lord has called us to go and serve the people in the world i think it is franklin who said it's an expression of love now uh, why why do we say that why do we say that? well it's an expression of love and everybody would understand that we say that specifically because we worship a god of love and like uh, i think many of you said this is an expression of our service to god god himself serves and so we serve so uh, uh, it's an expression of love because god himself is love so it is necessary for us to understand that we serve not because we are good we serve because god is good right? and god is the one who instill in us as one of you said the image of god in us that makes us want to serve so what we are really saying is when we are serving i am being like my god i am showcasing to the world who my god is the god we worship is a servant even though he is a king and that's why we sing that song which we haven't done in a long time the servant king god almighty jesus christ our lord is the servant king so i serve because i am being like my god uh that is the reason why service is unique to a christian we don't serve only because somebody uh you know has a need or uh somebody wants uh you know to be helped uh uh we serve because it's an ethos that we follow the ethos of outward looking we look away from ourselves it's not wrong to look at look at yourself and look after yourself but we don't there we are looking at the needs of the world so we are looking outward uh we are being inclusive rather than exclusive um while we do this while we're engaging ourselves in this kind of service we are in the process of conforming ourselves to the very image of Christ and that is our uh you know our destiny one day to be conformed to the very image of Christ so uh i hope uh we recognize why we serve but you know i there is something i'd like to mention and maybe we can debate about this and and sort of uh, get into a discussion of it uh christians are very you know uh, very much uh, recognized to be you know ser servants and they have served well but unfortunately christians have also had a very uh, we have a very bad legacy to live down we have uh a history that sometimes uh, is not very uh, laudable right i mean uh, if you if you look at the christian colonizers you know and many of them came from europe especially christian colonizers they colonized africa they colonized uh, many parts of asia including india they went to the americas and colonized but you know it's unfortunate i think it is necessary for us to say this because we need to be honest to look at our own history christians in they went in the name of christ they wanted to bring christ to others but they also unfortunately left a legacy of plunder of loot of destruction death to the indigenous people i mean uh, they you know institutionalized slavery and that is very unfortunate i mean i can understand slavery existed from the very beginning uh, during the egyptians and uh, you know the babylonians yes but we christians also indulged in that and institutionalized that right and uh, unfortunately in the name of christ uh uh and you know so uh, unfortunately we have to live down this 
very bad legacy where people serve themselves. Let me come to another uh, aspect. Uh, and this is directly answering the question, why do we serve? Now, do we serve to convert other people to our faith? Unfortunately, that is an accusation made against Christians. Uh, when we use our service as an inducement or to use it in a manipulative manner where we uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, sort of force people to want to convert, that would be a motivation that is not scriptural. We do not serve to convert. And unfortunately, we've got that label now on us because many have indulged in that. And that is against the constitution of our country. And uh, that is something that we should, we should never do. And it is utterly wrong. Now, am I saying that uh, those who are touched by our service and who want to convert, uh, is it wrong? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is we must give them the freedom of choice. We must never use our service as an inducement or, a or in a manipulative manner. If they see Christ in the way we serve, it is for them to choose. But we should never uh, ever induce them into changing their faith. Right? Uh, so we as Christians believe in the biblical mandate of uh, allowing freedom of conscience. Because that is what God allows. God gives us the freedom of conscience to choose. That is what he told the nation of Israel. He says, choose. I'm placing before you, you know, these choices, right? And uh, we should never trample on uh, the freedom of conscience that people uh, should have, should rightly have. That is a God-given gift that he has gifted all human beings through his image. He has given them the ability to choose. But going back to what I, I started off with, we must serve, no doubts about it. We should never be afraid to serve because we want to serve because our God serves. We are imitating him, but we should never use service in a, in a manner that can be construed as an inducement or, or being a manipulating the conscience or the emotions of others to want to convert. That we should never do. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. And I'm sure you might have some thoughts. I'd especially like to know your thoughts on, you know, this aspect of service uh, where we are being accused of uh, using our service to convert people. I'm sure uh, you might have some thoughts, so I'll be happy to hear that. I think Surya Murthy already has some thoughts to share. Go ahead, Surya Murthy. You are talking about inducement. See, there are some people in India, who argue that if you tell a Hindu that you may you will go to heaven, that is inducement. <laughs> or if you you may go to hell, that is a threat. So they are contra contrasting heaven and hell. Okay. Threat and inducement. Okay. Just a comment. <laughs> another, yeah. another observation. Yeah. You are talking about Dr. Livingston. Yeah. David Livingston. The Church of England spent a huge amount to send him to Africa yeah. to convert people to Christianity. And he was in Africa for several years. Yeah. Moving all the way from southern tip to the middle of Africa. Mm -hmm. he, he, as you said, he served the people very well. Yeah. But in his entire trip to Africa, he could convert only two persons <laughs> to Christianity. Yeah. So sometimes I also feel at least David Livingston could convert two people to Christianity 
and I have not been able to convert even one person. <laughs> uh, see, this is where I think uh, we sometimes get this, you know, uh, this whole conversion thing becomes very complicated. Uh, you mentioned about telling people about heaven and hell. Uh, of course, we are not discussing that. We are specifically discussing service. Like, for example, if I come and say, I'll give you free education and then uh, uh, you convert, that is an inducement. Uh, that is, and that is against the constitution of our country. And that should not be done. Uh, but preaching uh, about heaven and hell, that's, of course, that's, uh, uh, I think, slightly different from uh, providing a service. But very interesting, you mentioned about Livingston. Uh, I heard that, uh, you know, he uh, failed miserably in, in the so-called conversion. But, you know, I don't know how many he may have, uh, what do you say, inspired through his service, selfless service. He, uh, he modeled Christ. And I don't know how many would have come to the faith uh, after his death. And so, Surya Murthy, I would like to tell you, you know, don't worry about who you have converted or not converted. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. As long as you have, you know, modeled Christ, that's more, that's sufficient. Okay. Uh, Vanessa, you had a thought? Yeah. Uh, as I have been telling you, Pastor, that I, I'm not in Hyderabad now. I've been going around from place to place these past few months. So I have been attending these uh, Catholic churches. I have going to been going to church in the Catholic churches. I haven't uh, seen any uh, Christian church to go to. So there is one Catholic church that I have been going to, and I have seen that most of them are non-Christians over there. Because uh, when in the Catholic church, they have this uh, communion. Every day they have the communion. So... Uh, the uh, Christians, the Catholics that are going for communion are less than because after that, Father takes a, a, a <coughs> container which they have that white potassium uh, or what you say, those white sweets. Okay. So then after the after the Catholics take the communion, the non-Catholics, they all make a line for this, what he gives them in their hand. And there are so many of them that go for this. And I've noticed that the same people are coming and even during the service also, they are also singing. Even if they don't know all the prayers, but they're taking part in singing all, all the hymns. And then after, after the service, when everybody is leaving and going, they will go around collecting the hymnals and putting it in place and tidying up. So I, I don't know whether the church is helping them in any way or what, because they have not converted into to Catholics, but still they attend every day, they sing, they go for the communion where they're getting uh, those sweets to eat. So <laughs> I don't know what it is all about. Well, of course, uh, you know, uh, once again, uh, we must always never, uh, what should I say, a lack of a better word, you know, uh, judge their motives or what they are doing. That is not our job. But, you know, what you said reminds me of that verse that Jesus quoted. Uh, this is in Matthew 5. Uh, in the same way, he says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Is it possible that they, may, they are seeing good works and they are doing, they are glorifying God in their own way? And whether in their heart they're converted or not is up to the Holy Spirit to uh, you know, to determine. But we continue to do, we, we continue to let the light of Jesus shine through our good works. That is all we need to do. <laughs> you know? Good. Uncle Any Jack? Other? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, Shanti, and then after that, uh, Bertie. Yeah. Okay. Um, first, first of all, Vanessa, hi. We missed you at the convention. And uh, I just wanted to tell you as a sister to a sister, whichever city you go, you, you ping me and you ask me for a believer's church or, or a born again church or a church who's uh, not, not Catholic. And I'll give you the address with the number of the pastor so that it will help you to go to uh, a church which has, uh, you know, which is rooted in uh, similar 
uh, right uh, uh, beliefs as GCIs. If you find yourself in a place where there is no GCI, okay? Because Catholics can can really confuse us, especially now that you've grown so far, you know, the devil will always be looking at, okay, how do I pull Vanessa back? So how do I just confuse her thoughts? So just ping me, okay? And even in Jamshedpur, I will give you an address after this Bible study. Okay, having said that, um, you know, there are, uh, there are, there are times, and even just in your example that Vanessa has just given now, the, the world is hungry for love and hungry for Christ, even if they don't recognize it as a hunger for Christ. You know, his models, his, the, the, the moralities that he's speak, spoken about, the ideologies that he has, that the Lord has spoken about. There is no one like Christ and the world is beginning to notice that more and more. It is hungry. And at the end of the day, whether we make people a Christian or not is not upon us. We only go about with the, with the mandate of uh, go and preach the gospel to all nations and make disciples in his name. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts. So, uh, you know, one verse comes to my mind and somebody told this to me. We usually use this word for in some other context, but they explained it to me this way. They said it is better to give than to receive. We usually use this for money, right? Or to give alms or donation. But this particular person told me it is better that you give time than take time from people. That doesn't exactly apply to everything because there are times we require time from others too. But I'm saying in terms of time, in terms of our uh, attention, in terms of uh, giving off uh, even a, sh uh, a listening ear or giving out gospel, you know, sh sharing about something from your testimony could be a good way to convict somebody, you know, where the Lord, Holy Spirit is speaking. So it is better always to give, to, to give and to give, give service, uh, then take. Of course, we need also service for us because we are humans at the end of the day and we crave for human uh, endearment. Um, but uh, one thing is for sure, it is not us. and But through us, is where the Holy Spirit is most powerful. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Shanti. Yes, I, right, you rightly said that uh, even the smallest act of kindness uh, is a tremendous service. So we should never minimize, you know, even the little that we can do. Right. Thank you. Uh, Bertie, you had a thought? Please unmute yourself as you yes. speak. Thank you. Um, uh, you see, we are told in the Great Commission that go you therefore into all the world and proclaim the true gospel. It is the gospel that saves, yeah. Uh, but God expects the gospel, and you said we are the could be the only living Bible uh, seen by some people. And we we say we are Christians, we are born of the Spirit, we are you know belonging to Christ, and we are in communion in 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 fellowship and also in ministry and mission. I think we should uh, now, uh, having said that, and if we are truly and uh, faithfully serving the Lord, I think we should be moved to show that love. Yeah, it is the love that impacts, the love of Christ. Uh, we mirror Christ. We, what you call, model Christ, what do you say? Uh, let us think about more practical ways that we can take it. I was thinking about this community. I even mentioned at the convention, community engagement. I remember the church, GCI Church in Hyderabad, participating, I think a year, two or some three years back, in some uh, cleaning some stretch of the road. Right, Mr. Zakari? Uh, cleaning a stretch of road somewhere near Sairik Puri or somewhere. And it, uh, got, it caught the attention of the press. Mm -hmm. And uh, also uh, people observe it. Uh, and they see there is, uh, these are, uh, who are these people, like, you know, doing such a, uh, you know, swing this uh, service to the community. Maybe that can impact them. As you say, we're not there to tell them you convert from this to this. But the love, it's the Holy Spirit that uh, can convict them uh, through us. And it is actually Christ. We are participating in Christ's ministry this way or the other way. So maybe we keep that in mind. And if they come to us, be ready to, you know, somebody, uh, a pastor of Hyderabad or somebody be ready to, uh, you know, what is the reason? Some people may be stirred to ask the question. Some people may take good memories and, you know, they, you know, uh, later on, 
can come to faith in Christ. But have a ready track ready or give them the gospel when they do come and ask us who you are and whatever. Practical, a practical example, especially community engagement where, you know, not necessarily the press, but the public in general can see it and probably may approach us or, you know, keep good memories and the Holy Spirit can work in their lives. Can it, basically, it's love. We should go with a genuine love. Otherwise, you know, it can be difficult to, you know, to either this or whatever the service we provide. In fact, right. and really rely on the love of Christ yeah. to be able for us to do it. Right. Yes, Bertie, thank you. Uh, like you rightly said, uh, it is the Holy Spirit that ultimately moves a person to genuinely want to know, understand, and give their lives to Christ. And uh, all we can do is, I think I like that word again, uh, the participation. Uh, we only participate in Christ's love for the world. And yes. then uh, the Holy Spirit is always working. And of course, his timing is different from ours. We want everything instant. <laughs> but uh, sometimes the Spirit takes his own time to bring people. Right? Yes. Any other thoughts on... Uh... Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Uh, Bertie zeroed in on the crux of the problem. Bertie zeroed in on the crux of the problem. So we should not focus on conversion. We should do our part of serving others with love and for the joy of it. Sir, uh, the, there is a saying in the English language which says, a man convinced against his opinion is still of the same opinion. <laughs> this means, sir, this means no amount of logic, no amount of facts, no amount of sermons, no amount of lectures is going to convince the person. Ultimately, uh, the con uh, conversion or uh, transformation is an act of uh, God. Only God can, the Holy Spirit can touch a person and the person is convinced and it, he, is, he, he, he accepts God's grace. That's it. That's true. Very true, Mr. Poppin. Very good. Very true. Thank you. Thank you, Franklin. Yes. Of course, we, we do not forget the fact that uh, uh, we are called to preach the gospel and we are called to make disciples. But then we don't force somebody to become disciples. Uh, we take the wonderful message that, that Jesus you know, is the savior of the world. And those who want to be discipled, we are ready to disciple them. Uh, so uh, we cannot force them. And like you rightly said, uh, you can't go against an opinion that they haven't changed. And uh, that is where we need to give that freedom of conscience for each one to be genuinely convinced and do it of their own accord without any kind of uh, uh, you know, allurement, inducements, you know, manipulation. So I think we Christians must be uh, very, very, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, honest about that. Okay, well, I think, uh, thank you. For, some of you had some very interesting thoughts and uh, very helpful. Uh, I, as we come close to the end of our study today, uh, there is one quotation I'd like to just uh, uh, pass on to you. Uh, we're talking specifically about service, you know, when we serve. Uh, Richard Foster, who is another person that I've referred to in the past, uh, he writes something about the discipline of service. He says, of all the spiritual disciplines, service is the most conducive to the growth of the grace of humility within us. Right? He says, service is the most conducive to the growth of the grace of humility within us. Any comments on that? <laughs> Why would us, you know, serving others make us humble? Uh, supposed to be making us humble. Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Because, uh, because it just takes, uh, you just, it's other centered. And, uh, you know, uh, man has to come out of the self centeredness. And God is other centered, the triune, agape love, you know, 100% giving to each other. And in Christ, we have seen it, his love to the extent he gave his life and served us, saved, served humanity and the process saved humanity and bringing, you know, uh, us uh, in the fellowship of the triune God. 
Uh, right. It is, uh, you know, we are in the in the act of service, whatever it is, we are actually giving of ourselves, giving of ourselves, you know, and right. that uh, that uh, helps us to uh, problem. Uh, yeah, that helps us to grow in the grace of humility. Right. Okay. Thank you, Bharti. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, when I uh, reflect on that particular quotation. Uh, when you serve, you become a servant. And not very many people like to be called a servant. <laughs> and that automatically makes you, you know, humble. So uh, when you serve, you're a servant. But uh, thankfully, we are a servant in the right place. Let me end with one last scripture. And this is found in Hebrews. Just to be encouraging to all of us, you know, because we uh, definitely serve in various capacities. Uh, we, we are unable to serve like some of the great missionaries have served. Uh, but uh, there is uh, a scripture that encourages us that in whatever little service we can provide, you know, uh, God not notices that. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, he says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown, shown him as you have helped his people. And continue to help them. So he's, you know, the, the author here is saying that God never forgets whatever little you have done. And it says, uh, uh, by showing that, by doing that little act of service, you have shown love to God himself. You know, that is what uh, Matthew, that uh, Matthew 25, one of the parables says, right? Even if you have done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. So Christ takes it personally. So let us, uh, I think this is a wonderful spiritual discipline. I think we should all be ready to serve, you know, wherever there is a need, like Mr. Suryamurthy said, and wherever we see where we can bless people, we must continue to be able to do that. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Shanti, go ahead. Yes. Am I allowed to put one quote? That Please. I really like. Uh, this is from St. Francis de Sales. He says, great occasions for serving God come seldom. Great occasions for serving God come seldom. But little ones surround us daily. Yeah. I thought that's very interesting. That some people or some of us wait for service. It should be big things. Right. But, you know, little things, the littlest of the things become a greatest form of praise to the Lord, as Billy Graham says. Yes. Oh, yes. So that is so true. I mean, and sometimes we minimize those little things that we feel, oh, you know, we haven't done much. But, I mean, we have a God who can keep record of all of those wonderful things. And isn't it wonderful that he keeps record of all the good and he's willing to forget all the bad. <laughs> you know, uh, wonderful that service. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Franklin? I would like you to say, give the last uh, comment <laughs> as well as close in prayer, if you would like to do that, please. Thank you. Sir, uh, your last uh, quote, Hebrew 6.10, was yeah. just gray, unbeatable, sir. <laughs> sir, uh, that's, we, that's sir, we, sir, we learn a lesson, a profound lesson we learn is, don't worry about the results. Like David Livingston, uh, uh, God will take care whether to call people, to uh, convict people, call them or not call them. Our part is to show love and service to others. And if we are doing it even in small ways, God will bless us. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mr. Poppins. Uh, Thank do you. the honors of closing in prayer. Okay, sir. Gracious Lord, a loving Father in heaven, what a privilege and joy, Lord, to come together and to study your word. Lord, every time we study, Lord, we examine ourselves and we take a status look of our own convictions, of our own actions. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for giving us the written word where we check ourselves, where do we stand? Thank you so much, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the instructions you give us. Thank you, Lord, for the subject of service. Lord, thank you so much, Father. Ultimately, Lord, Service springs from love, a love that which you have given to us. 
Lord, fill us with your love in abundance so that, Lord, whether we are conscious or not, we will even, we will reflect this in our day-to-day -day living everywhere. Lord, help us, Father, to serve wherever there is a need. And even if circumstances or situations warrant that we don't have power to help, that we don't have the money to help, Lord, let us go into the privacy of our rooms and let us remember a poor, the, the particular person or the group of people going through traumatic times, Lord, and ask for your intervention. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to understand, not to worry about the end results of our service, because you take note of our love and will bless us. And so, Lord, we pray, fill us, Lord, with your love and help us, Lord, to grow under your wings at all times. And even as we pray this, Lord, we pray, Lord, please hasten, Lord, the coming of your kingdom to this earth in its fullness as quickly as possible. Lord, there are nations that, that are going through traumatic times. There are whole groups of people, gender group, racial group, who are, are at the receiving end. We know, Lord, ultimately, the real solution is the arrival of your kingdom under Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, hasten the coming of your kingdom to this earth. To this earth. Thank you. Thank you, Father, for helping every one of us on this, on this Zoom and even those who are watching to understand, Lord, your working. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen.